Charles Parker was born and raised in Atlanta. He wanted to be an entrepreneur. His goal was to be a millionaire. Charles's wife called me to say that he hadn't come home that night. He was missing. Then his car was located. The car has been square clean. There were no fingerprints. He tells police that he smelled a rotting body in his well. The missing person case had become a homicide. But they did not have any forensic evidence that tied to who was responsible. His partner was the last person to see Charles before he went missing. He had a criminal history of aggravated assault. Police got the GPS from the cell phone. The locations that showed up were where his car was found. And where Charles's body was pulled from the well. Someone tried to withdraw $200,000 out of Charles's business account. Detectives were able to access the bank's surveillance footage to find out who was the specific person who had tried to withdraw the money. I was frustrated because we know who did it. Let's just go and get it. Fortunately, some witnesses were intimidated because he would use voodoo to scare people into not talking. successful people choose to settle down and raise a family in Monroe as opposed to the much larger city of Atlanta. But the dream of a promising future for one of these ambitious young men was about to be tragically broken. On Monday, January 16th, 2012, about 8 a.m., Kenesha Parker contacted the 911 center, advised them that she hadn't seen her husband or heard from him since the day before when they were at church that afternoon. Kanisha said that this was out of character for Charles because Charles had never been gone this long and he always stayed in contact with her. She said it's not like him to just disappear and not be available and not answer his phone and all of her calls are going to voicemail. Kanisha also said that neither his friends nor his family had heard from him either. Kanisha files a missing persons report and is soon visited by investigators who ask her if Charles would have any reason to want to disappear. She told the police that there were no signs of trouble in his life. He was working, he was stable. There's just no problems that she knew of that might cause. He wasn't one to sow any discord. He was the peacemaker, you know, just always fun loving. Charles was a lover of people, church folks, old people. He liked them all. and. They loved him. Charles Parker was uh, popular in high school. He was the 10th grade homecoming king. (laughs) And he went on to attend the University of Georgia and graduated with a business degree. And shortly after, he married his high school sweetheart, Kenesha. Charles and Kenesha were both brought up in the church. I think they were good for each other. She loved Charles. And I know he loved her. Charles had a great job working in the banking industry. He worked for Bank of America, but he ultimately wanted to be an entrepreneur. He wanted to own a recording studio. He wanted to have a restaurant. He wanted a barber shop, you know, so he, he just had so many things. Before Charles went missing, he was about to start his own poultry business. The poultry business was a real surprise to me because I never knew he had an interest in a chicken farm. He just wanted to be successful. Detectives then inquire about Charles's personal life. 
Ganesha was asked if there was any extramarital affairs or anything inappropriate going on between them, and she adamantly denied that there was anything inappropriate there. Kanisha said that Charles was happy, there were no problems between the two of them, and she could not think of anybody who would want to hurt Charles. Investigators asked Kanisha to tell them what she remembers about the last time she saw her husband. Kanisha said the day that Charles went missing, they were celebrating Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day at church. And Charles had recited Dr. King's iconic I Have a Dream speech. Uh, at church for the congregation, which is something that he did every year. That Sunday on the 15th, Charles and Kenesha were leaving church. Charles asked Kenesha if she wanted to go with him to go look at some property for his chicken farm business. Kenesha ultimately said she didn't want to go, so Charles left from there. Kenesha revealed that Charles was driving a 2010 Chrysler 300. It was black in color with chrome rims. We put out a bolo on the vehicle as well as the driver. Detectives asked Kanisha where exactly Charles was going when he left the church. He was going to meet his business partner, Victor Blockham, to look at a piece of property for the chicken farm. Victor Blockham was actually the, the last person to see Charles before he went missing. The team has Victor Blockham come down to the station for an interview so they can nail down a timeline for the day Charles disappeared. Victor was shocked when Walton PD told him that Charles was missing. Victor's account was they did get together on that Sunday afternoon. And they went out to Comer, Georgia, to look at some property. Victor told law enforcement that Charles picked him up around 1 o'clock. They went to go look at a property. And then afterwards, Charles took Victor to his home around 445. After speaking with Victor, Investigators now have a timestamp of when Charles was last seen. At this point, police have no evidence to suggest any criminal activity took place. So they place the investigation on hold and hope for Charles to return home on his own accord. We know theoretically Charles could have taken off somewhere for the weekend. So that's why we couldn't take any further steps. So law enforcement, while speaking to Kanisha, they informed her that they didn't have any other options at this time. They saw no evidence of foul play, and so they had to wait until further evidence developed before they could take more action, because at this point, it was simply Charles was missing for a short period of time. Then, 48 hours after Charles Parker's disappearance, the case takes a turn. Charles Parker's wallet was found by a small child in the downtown area of Athens. Law enforcement obtained the wallet and forensics first dusted the wallet for fingerprints. They didn't find any additional or unknown fingerprint samples. They checked the contents of the wallet and saw that nothing was missing, so they were able to rule out a type of a robbery. Finding a wallet with nothing stolen 25 miles from where Charles was last seen quickly raises suspicions for detectives that perhaps foul play was involved in Charles's disappearance. The team immediately examines the area where the wallet was found to search for clues. So standard routine that law enforcement does in an investigation is they check for cameras or surveillance footage by nearby businesses. They looked, they couldn't find anything that showed anybody dropping off or dumping the wallet. Investigators call Kanisha to update her and ask why Charles might have been in that area, but she says she has no idea. Then, the following day, police make another disturbing discovery. Approximately the third day of the investigation, we, we caught a break on uh, Charles Parker's car. It was located in a parking lot in Athens, around where the wallet was found. The vehicle was processed. Processing involved dusting for fingerprints, collecting any DNA or fibers. As the team processes the car, they are shocked by what they don't find. CSI techs check the vehicle for DNA and prints, and they come up with nothing. To their surprise, the car has been scrubbed clean. There were just no fingerprints, which is not what you would expect. Investigators' suspicions increase as they question, why would Charles Parker's wallet and car be found so far from his house. Police are very concerned now that something definitely, something is wrong. 
that's when they realized that someone obviously was trying to clear up their tracks. At this point, law enforcement is now convinced that something terrible has happened to Charles. Police then searched the well, and then that's when they made the discovery of the human body. They discovered that he was shot four times in the chest, and there were no bullets found in the body. The lack of evidence pretty much left the investigators back at square one. For three days, 25-year-old Atlanta banker Charles Parker has been missing. But after the discovery of his wallet and car nearly 25 miles from his house, detectives are starting to suspect foul play. Once the car was located, the wallet's been located, and Charles not being located, the investigation is, we'll say, heating up. Once the vehicle was processed, the detectives to canvass the area, which basically meaning knock and talk. You're knocking on doors, you're asking folks in the neighborhood if they had seen or heard anything. But the team comes up empty-handed. While investigators continue to search the area for clues, Charles's family is actively on the hunt for him as well. The family reaches out to the Metro Atlanta media and they offer a reward for information leading to Charles' disappearance. And Charles's tight-knit community of Monroe also joins the search. The community came together and we did searches going into the neighborhood, you know, where they said he was last seen passing out flyers hopes that somebody has seen something while charles's family and community desperately search for him detectives focus their efforts on analyzing his cell phone the next step for law enforcement was to subpoena the cell phone provider for charles they wanted to track the gps information in his phone to see if that would lead them to any type of location as to where the phone currently is located or has been in the past three days what they find is that the last ping from his cell phone was, to their surprise, an hour east of their home in Oglethorpe County. It's also a half hour away from where his vehicle and wallet were discovered in Athens, and nowhere near the property he looked at the day he disappeared. And so the question is, why would Charles have gone to Oglethorpe County, and how would he get there? We did talk to Kenesha. Kenesha understand why Charles would be in that area at that time. With no time to spare, detectives race out to the locale where Charles's phone was last activated. And they then search the area, but unfortunately, they don't find anything that leads them to what happened to Charles. With the cell phone location a bust, investigators continue their search for the missing banker, but to no avail. Days turn into weeks, and as Lee comes up empty, the family begins to lose hope. I was in constant prayer, but I dreamed I saw him in a dark spot. I had gone to church, and the Lord told me that his whereabouts were going to be revealed. Then, on February 20th, five weeks after Charles was reported missing, a farmer in Oglethorpe County contacts local police with some troubling information. He tells police that he smells a rotting body in his well. And they wonder how he knows what a rotting body smells like. And he says he served time in Vietnam and he'll never forget what rotting flesh smells like. Police then search the well and then that's where they made the discovery of the human body. They searched the body for any type of identifying marks. They found a tattoo that was consistent with the tattoo that Charles had on his chest. At that point, they realized the body they had recovered was Charles, and now the missing person case had become a homicide. The body is well decomposed at this point. They discover that he was shot four times in the chest, and there were no bullets found in the body. Law enforcement was shocked to find Charles Parker in this well. After weeks of searching, detectives are stunned that the 25-year-old banker has now been found 
dumped in a well in the middle of nowhere. The team immediately dissects the crime scene to look for clues. They searched for fingerprints, but they couldn't find anything. They couldn't find any tire tracks. At the crime scene where Charles Parker's body was found, there was no weapon located, no other evidence. Investigators searched the area surrounding the well for anything that could provide a lead. The area in Oglethorpe County where Charles's body was found, it's a rural area. And so there are no security cameras, no witnesses. The crime scene does not provide any additional clues. The lack of evidence pretty much left investigators back at square one. We did not have any new leads as to who might have been responsible or who might have been involved or even a witness to Charles' death. After investigators finish processing the crime scene, the team has the grim task of informing Charles's family. I proceeded to go to Charles's residence and meet with Kenesha. She was visually upset. Um, broke down. It's one of the hardest things to do in law enforcement is to notify a family member of the death of another. Well, when they called me to tell me that it was him, I went into the kitchen. I've got a CD player in there. And Charles had sang this song, had written a song, actually. It was called Fred Knight, Thyself. And I began to play it. The family was devastated to see that this had happened to a young man who was in the prime of his life. As Charles's loved ones reel from shock and devastation, detectives are more determined than ever to find justice and answers for them. This case was clearly a target homicide based upon the manner that Charles' body was found. But law enforcement had the problem of not having any forensic evidence that tied to who was responsible. We have to do a 180, turn back to the initial day, the initial report, start questioning all over again. Investigators begin by looking into the person who last saw Charles alive, his business partner, Victor Blockham. And to their utter shock, they discover the religious 25-year-old banker, Charles, had gotten himself involved with a man who had a dangerous past. Victor was a convicted felon. He had a criminal history of drug arrests and aggravated assault. Detectives are stunned that Charles, the successful, ambitious businessman, would partner up with a criminal. We thought, why would Charles get involved with Victor Blocko? Five weeks after Charles Parker was reported missing just outside Atlanta, his corpse is found hidden at the bottom of a rural well. Determined to solve this case, investigators have just discovered Charles's business partner, Victor Blockham, has a violent past and a criminal record. Digging deeper, detectives ask Charles's family for more information on his relationship with Victor. Charles wanted to figure out how he could start his own business and be an entrepreneur, and he decided that he wanted to start his own chicken farm. He was introduced to Victor Blockham by the realtor, Sean Hill, who he was working with to find property for this chicken farm. You could see a major difference between Victor and Charles. You could see Victor as a country boy, and you could obviously see Charles as a city boy. But Victor had told me that Charles was the money, but that he would be running the farms. Victor had managed several chicken farming companies for people before. He supposedly was one of the best chicken farmers around. Victor knew the chicken business. Charles Parker had no clue. He was just looking to invest into someone that knew how to run a business. Charles's family tells investigators that he was well aware of Blockham's checkered past, but decided to give him a chance. Charles wanted to help Victor. Charles finding out that he had a troubled past is just indicative of him being a Christian. You know, You'll have to give people a chance. Armed with this new information, detectives circle back to Victor Blockham. 
he is devastated that his business partner has been killed. Victor acknowledged that he had a troubled past, but he really wanted to put it behind him in favor of pushing his business forward. Victor said that this was a setback and that he had absolutely no reason to do anything bad to Charles. With no evidence that links Victor to the crime, investigators ask him if he has any idea who would want to harm Charles. Victor then drops a bombshell. Victor said this investor in this chicken farm was a shady character and a drug dealer. Victor said that he personally believes that it was the investor that was responsible for Charles' killing. Now aware that Charles had an investor in his flesh business and that their money may have come from drugs investigators work to identify this mysterious figure meanwhile charles's grief-stricken family lays him to rest charles is laid to rest at his longtime church where he attended and his family attends the church was packed and this is the same church where just weeks prior the family witnessed charles give the iconic Dr. King, I have a dream speech. There were praise leaders and we danced and brought the house down because, you know, it was a home going. We had a blast because that's who Charles was. Never a dull moment. Always joking and laughing and that's the way he would have wanted it. During my experience with the Monroe Police Department and in law enforcement in general, this was one higher emotional cases a city member of Monroe from where I was living at the time kind of hit home as the community and family mourn their beloved son detectives follow Victor's lead and connect with Charles's investor in his poultry business at this point law enforcement has to go deeper and look at the individuals to find out if they had anything to do with Charles's murder checks with Charles's family to see who the investor was for this business. And they discover that the primary investor was a lottery winner, Kathy Scruggs. Kathy Scruggs won about $12 million in the Georgia lottery. And uh, Charles had approached her and presented a business idea to her. And she wound up giving him a half a million dollars to uh, proceed with this business. Detectives looked into Kathy Scruggs, and she was not involved in violence or drugs or any type of crime. So that's directly going against what Victor Blockham had described as a shady investor. But why would Victor lie about where Charles got his money? Detectives pay Miss Scruggs a visit to learn more about her investment. Mrs. Scruggs was a longtime customer at the bank Charles worked with. He had a long-standing relationship with her, and because of that, Mrs. Scruggs to Charles. Miss Scruggs tells investigators that the 500000 was the down payment to help secure the loan to buy the farm. She tells them the loan was for $3.2 million, and they were awaiting approval from the bank when Charles disappeared. I Miss mean, Scruggs felt horrible about what happened to Charles. She said she was upset, and it wasn't any time that I saw during the interviews where a red flag went up. As Miss Scruggs provides a solid alibi. Investigators now realize this case involves half a million dollars and that Charles could have been killed for that money. And now the detectives know Victor Blockham lied to them about the investor. They have to ask, what else could Blockham be hiding? So investigators are suspicious. They believe that Victor Blockham may not be telling them the truth and may not be forthcoming with all of the details about the day that Charles went missing. Investigators have been trying to figure out who killed Atlanta entrepreneur Charles Parker and dumped his body in a rural well. After learning that Charles's business partner, Victor Blockham, lied to police about the background of their investor, detectives head to the bank to try to uncover 
what it is Victor may be hiding. Detectives find out from the investor, Kathy Scruggs, Charles had uh, tried to get a loan in the amount of $3.2 million in order to purchase the chicken farm facility. The bank tells investigators that when they looked at Charles's business team, they decided to turn him down. Charles had been denied that loan. And the reason Charles had been denied was because Victor Blockham was a convicted felon. Victor Blockham had a checkered past. He had been charged with aggravated assault, stealing vehicles, even selling narcotics. Detectives learned from the bank that a month after they denied Charles the loan, he reapplied under different circumstances. We learned that Charles wanted to create space between he and Victor from a business standpoint. So Charles sent numerous letters to the bank trying to appeal the decision, explaining to them that he and Victor Blockham were no longer business partners. Charles had been attempting to have Victor removed from the business deal. And perhaps that was a motive for Victor in murdering Charles. So now we're saying, is this the reason why Charles was killed? As a motive begins to crystallize, the question is, did Victor know Charles was cutting him out of the business? The bank then tells detectives of a suspicious occurrence that happened shortly after Charles disappeared. Two days after Charles went missing, on January 17th, someone tried to withdraw $200,000 out of Charles's business account for Parker Poultry. The detectives were able to access the bank's surveillance footage to find out who was the specific person who had tried to withdraw the money. As investigators watch the footage, they are floored by what they see. The person trying to withdraw the money was Victor Block. When Victor tried to withdraw the money, he was told at the bank there was a hold put on the account. The, the account was frozen. Victor then proceeded to go to three or four other branches in the area and attempted to withdraw the money. At this point, we believe that Victor Blockham is not being honest and that his story is not adding up. So we need to take a closer look at his phone record. As Victor Blockham looks increasingly suspicious, Detectives take out a warrant for his cell phone data to see where exactly he was the day Charles was murdered. Detectives had to put in a request in order to access the cell phone GPS information. And once they got the GPS information, they were able to see that this contradicted Victor's story. Victor had told police that Charles dropped him at his home at 4.45 p.m., but his cell phone records say something entirely different. In triangulating the cell phone service, we were able to show, okay, Victor was obviously lying about what time he dropped him off because it showed that there was just no way Victor could have been dropped off at his home at 445 because his phone pinged off a tower far away at that time. And where Victor's phone does place him on the day of Charles's disappearance is even more damning. According to the records, the locations that showed up, were the location where Charles' wallet was found and where his car was found. And also Oglethorpe County, where Charles' body was pulled from the well. There was no way that Victor's alibi matched up to what the cell phone towers were showing. Victor's back was against the wall. Authorities now determine that Victor Blockham is their primary suspect in the murder of Charles Parker. getting nervous that Charles was about to cut him out. He wanted his hands on that investor money. Having very little evidence of any DNA fingerprints, the murder weapon makes it extremely difficult to prosecute a case, especially for murder. become the prime suspect in the brutal murder of his business partner, Charles Parker. After discovering Victor's phone pinged near the well where Charles's body was found, and learning Charles planned to dump Victor before purchasing the property for his chicken farm, detectives reach out to realtor Sean Hill to see if Victor knew his days in the business 
were numbered. Victor would contact me and he was getting nervous that Charles was about to cut him out. And I've got emails where he actually emailed me this, Sean, please protect me, take care of me, don't let him cut me out. Victor didn't trust anybody. He'd been done wrong a lot. So Victor would tell me how many people had gave him an opportunity and then they'd take it away from him. With Victor's financial motive for killing Charles now crystal clear, detectives still have one nagging question. Why would Charles have gone with his soon-to-be ex-partner, Victor, to see the property on that fateful day? At that point, Charles had not disclosed to Victor that he was attempting to get him out of the business. The theory is that Charles still trusted Victor. And so when there was the idea of going out to look at a property, Charles had no reason to think that Victor was going to do anything bad to him because it was just going to be just the two of them going out there. It became clear that Victor likely killed Charles out of retaliation because Charles was cutting him out of the $3.2 million deal. It gave detectives the additional information needed to show Victor's motive to kill Charles so that he could get the money. They had a suspect and they had a clear motive, but without that forensic evidence, you wouldn't be able to prove to a jury that Victor was the shooter. While investigators believe they have found their killer, the case is far from over. Now investigators need to find evidence to prove it. Detectives were trying to find witnesses who could shed some light on Victor and Victor's possible involvement with Charles' death and what he was doing on that day. Luckily, the team finds several witnesses who say Victor told them about his role in Charles' death. But when they're asked to speak on the record, they unexpectedly clam up. Fortunately, some witnesses were intimidated because Victor would use voodoo to scare people into not talking. I remember there was one witness where Victor left chicken bones in front of their house as a way to intimidate them so that they would not talk to law enforcement. With no witnesses willing to talk, investigators have nothing concrete tying Victor to the crime scene. Having very little evidence of any DNA, fingerprints, the murder weapon makes it extremely difficult to prosecute a case, especially for murder, against someone. Authorities remain tight-lipped about the case and do not reveal any suspicions to Victor in the hopes he slips up. But as time goes on, investigators grow fearful that this case is growing cold. So weeks are turning into months. The family is growing restless. They want answers. I spoke to the police lots of times, um, just calling to inquire about what was going on and what was taking so long. I was frustrated because, you know, we knew Victor did it. I mean, let's just go and get him. Even though the team is confident that they can build their case on circumstantial evidence, the district attorney refuses to prosecute without greater proof. There is no forensic evidence that can pinpoint Victor to being involved directly with the killing. And there's no witnesses who are willing to step forward and share the information that they have. But detectives are not willing to let this case just wither on the vine and die. Investigators are determined to get justice for Charles Parker and his family. So they continue to chase leads and pursue witnesses. But it's all to no avail. Victor Blockham lays low in the countryside outside Atlanta for the next four years. But in 2016 district attorney takes office and he's willing to roll the dice he picks up the file and decides you know what screw it there was no reason to let the case sit there any longer on may 25th 2016 four years after charles's murder victor block was finally arrested for the murder of charles parker it was a lengthy process but i was still grateful and i knew that it would happen Blockham faces seven charges, including malice murder and armed robbery. When I was told that Victor was arrested for the murder, it brought a sense of closure for me, and there's going to be some closure for the family. 
to see Victor arrested and to see his mug shot, that meant he was going to be held accountable for what he had done. And now detectives finally get their chance to sit down face to face with the man they believe is responsible for Charles' death. Law enforcement must get a confession out of him. Investigators are pressing him for a confession, but Victor had no part of that. Victor wasn't confessing. He wasn't admitting guilt. Law enforcement knows that without a confession or forensic evidence, this case is an uphill battle. Can they finally get a conviction? Or will Charles Parker's killer go free? That's why the case sat so long under the first district attorney. But the next district attorney comes in and then picks up the file and decides, you know what, screw it, we're going to take the trial. There was no reason to let the case sit there any longer. You indict Blockham and take him to trial, and then from there you just let the jury decide. It's a gamble, but at this point, what else do they have to lose? Victor Blockham has been arrested and charged with the murder of his business partner, Atlanta banker Charles Parker. With no confession and only circumstantial evidence tying Victor to the case, prosecutors have a rough road ahead of them to try to secure a conviction. Our trial strategy was to rely upon the evidence of Victor had the motive, so we had the information from the bank showing Victor made a beeline for the bank account even before Charles' body was found. We had the information from the cell phone providers to know that there was no way that Victor's alibi matched up to what the cell phone towers were showing. We know that Victor's phone was pinging close to the area where Charles' body was found, and that area was nowhere near Victor's house. The prosecution prepares for battle, but shortly before the trial gets underway, they catch a surprising break. Victor was in jail and Victor could not keep his mouth shut. What Victor did was he went to another inmate and offered that inmate money. If that inmate would testify that he was at Victor's house, he saw Charles drop Victor off. That would support Victor's alibi. The inmate then goes to the DA and tell them that Victor, while in jail, asked him to help provide an alibi for him. We now had evidence we can put in front of the jury that Victor was actively trying to find people to lie inside of the jail with him about his alibi. The DA contends Victor's bribes are equivalent to an admission of guilt. I felt very confident in our case, and I felt that we had what we needed to gain the conviction. In April of 2018, six years after Charles Parker was shot and his body dumped in a well, Victor Blockham stands trial for his murder. As the trial gets underway, prosecutors encounter a disturbingly familiar hurdle. When it came time for the trial, all of a sudden, the inmate gets amnesia, and he doesn't want to testify. The DA's office believes it may have something to do with the fact that Victor Blockham is believed to have dabbled in voodoo. Is the jury seeing this as oh, Victor must be innocent because look how the inmate doesn't want to say what the government wants. It really was a difficult time in the middle of the trial. But luckily, the witness finally gathers his courage and decides to tell the truth. Something triggers inside of the inmate to the point where he communicated to us, I'm ready to testify now. We asked him, were you ever at Victor's house? He said no. He said he was never at Victor's house. That entire story was Victor's idea. As a result of this strategy and this testimony in the trial, Victor Blockham agrees to plead guilty. We told Victor's attorney that we would let Victor plead to manslaughter to a term of 20 years in prison, but Victor had to do an allocution. An allocution is where the defendant stands in court on the record and says, I am guilty. I did the crime. I'm responsible for Charles' death. I looked at him. He looked at me. And he didn't look like he had any regret. When I heard that Victor admitted to murdering Charles, it just, it took breath away. That was just unbelievable that anybody would do such a heinous crime for a chicken farm. It was a relief knowing that all the efforts made 
I mean, it's justice for the families, uh, it, and it's it's justice for the victim. Kanisha was grateful, just like the family. She was ready to put this chapter of her life behind her and then move on with the rest of her life. Thankful and grateful, but in the end, nobody really won. He didn't win. We didn't win. You know, everybody suffered a great loss. What the world should know about Charles was that he didn't just recite the the King's speech. You know, he actually he he lived it. He had dream you can kill the dreamer but his his dreams still live on